You guys, welcome to How to Start a New Ministry class. Thank you for giving your time and coming and hanging out with us, and hopefully you'll learn something and be able to leave here and be able to start a new ministry wherever you're at. And so before we get started, let's pray, and then we'll hop into it. God, we thank you so much for who you are in our lives. For the fact that you give us the opportunity to be able to partner with you and build up the kingdom. God, to see souls be changed. To see lives be changed and souls connected to you for eternity is such an incredible gift. And we're so grateful to be a part of that journey. God, we love you so much. And thank you for being there for us and walking with us on this journey. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, my name is Willie Price, and my wife and I leave the campus ministry at ASU. All right? So, you know, go to school there if you're not there now. I'm just kidding. And this is Daniel Garcia, and he is in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so, yeah, my wife and I have been in the ministry since 2012, and we've led kind of everything. Singles, campus teens, marrieds over the years, but our heart remains in the campus ministry. And I believe, and you've probably heard this before, that the lifeblood of the church is the campus ministry. But I wholeheartedly believe that's the truth. And that if you're in a, a church where there's a vibrant, thriving campus ministry, the church as a whole is a healthy and thriving church. The next level of evangelists, singles, interns, marriages can come out of the campus ministry if it's built in the right way. Yeah. That's why this topic is so important of how to build a ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, and we've given you a sheet here, here real quick that has all the scriptures on it, and in the middle there's practicals, we're going to go over those later, but so you can read along, the scriptures are on this sheet here. And if you don't have one, I have one left. Here's your name. And if you need one, I can send it to you digitally or something like that later. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, By the grace of God, God, God has given me, I have laid a foundation as a wide building. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. Mm -hmm. Paul tells the people in Corinth that it's imperative that you build with materials that can stand the test of time. He says fire will test each person's work. And fire will test the quality of your campus ministry so that building is very important. And what you build with is very important. Now with that being said... We have to understand that God does the heavy lifting. So no matter, no amount of, of great preaching, of great Bible talks, whatever you do, if it's just all about that, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But God is in control. Yep. So we can't go into it and go, man, if I preach the best sermon, souls are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. If I have the best Bible talk, people are going to become Christians. Because it's not about us, it's about what is God right. doing mm -hmm. through us. Yep. But our job is to plant seed, water it, and provide an avenue for God to work within our group and on our campuses. But how do we do that? So what we're going to do this afternoon is go through a journey here to hopefully effectively answer this question. And for my portion of the class, we're going to look at Nehemiah and see what he did when he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Then Daniel's going to talk about the heart behind what it takes to build something that will last. And so before we hop in, let me give you a rundown of what's going on here in Nehemiah. So turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. At this point, Jerusalem has been destroyed by the Babylonians, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. And because of that destruction, many of the Jews were exiled and brought to foreign lands. And now Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes, at a time when the Jews were released from the exile in Babylonia. He initiated and supervised the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. At this point in the story, the temple at Jerusalem had been rebuilt, but the Jewish community there was dispirited, defenseless against his non-Jewish neighbors. And when Nehemiah heard the news about how his people were feeling, he was cut to the heart and asked the king if he could go back and rebuild the wall. And he was given permission. So we're going to pick up here in Nehemiah chapter 2, in verse 11, when he arrives in Jerusalem. Let's go, Willie. Everybody there? Mm -hmm. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I sat out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. 
By night I went out through the valley, valley gate toward the jackal well, and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate, and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for a mountain to get through. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews, or the priests or the nobles or officials of any others, who will be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official of Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim in a historic right to it. So guys, my first point on how to build a ministry is we've got to survey the wall and fix the holes. We've got to deal with the sin in our group. Nehemiah understand that you, could, that you cannot build without a good foundation. So we set out to survey the wall and see I mean, what problems were present. Our ministers are just like that. I mean, all of them, they come in different shapes and sizes. Some of us come in with, we've got some students that haven't had a leader in a long time. Some were starting from scratch. Some have, have been around for a while and gotten stagnant. But each situation, we've got to find out, man, what's the foundation? Yep. I've got to test this wall. Is it a healthy wall? Is it a good wall? What's really going on? And I've got to see where people are really at for us to be able to move forward. Because we can't build on a foundation that's broken down. We have to fix the foundation to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's super important for you as the campus leader to wade into people's lives. That you deal with unconfessed sin and consecrate the camp. Your group won't be able to go far without you and your students being holy. Mm -hmm. In Joshua 7, in verse 13, the Bible says this. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Amen. The word consecrate here means to make holy. If our students are not made holy before God, we cannot win our campuses. Mm. So it's imperative that you make time to deal with the sin in your group. Because it's impossible to hold on to the devoted things and move forward with God. The other day I was watching this documentary and I, and I found out about bush people in America, in, in Africa. And what they do is when, they, when they, their water, their source of water is scarce, they try to find more water. And to find more water, what they do is they trap a baboon. And so they, they find these, um, what are they, what are they, uh, salt, salt, uh, termite hills, right? And they put some seeds inside of a termite hill. And they make sure that the baboon is watching them put the seeds inside the termite hill because the baboon gets curious. So the baboon goes over to the termite hill and puts his hand inside and grabs the seeds. But because his hand is closed on the seeds, his hand cannot come out of the termite hill. If he lets go of the seeds, he can pull his hand out. But he's so focused on that, i got to have these things inside. He keeps his hand closed. So what they do is they give him salt pills. And he eats the salt, eats the salt, eats the salt, and gets really, really thirsty. So then they release him from the termite hill, and he runs straight to water. And they follow him out. And they will as they find water. Now think about this for us. When there is sin in our lives that we're holding on to, we're like that baboon. Mm -hmm. If we just let go of the sin, we can move forward. But we're so caught up in, man, I, I really want to have this thing that we can't move from where we're at. If our students are stuck in a place like that, we can't move forward with God. We've got to help them to see that the seeds in their hands are not as important as the kingdom of God. They've got to let go. But you've got to help them to consecrate the camp. Now, some practical things that we did in our group to help this to happen is that we have a praise and worship night. And just saying songs to God. Got people's hearts real soft, you know, ready, ready to move forward, and then we had a time of confession. Or we could have a prayer night. And we broke it down in kind of different sections. Pray for the lost, pray for yourself, and then we had a time of confession prayer. And we split up in groups and say, hey, let's just get together and talk. And as people started sharing their hearts, and scriptures were being read, it started to come out what was really going on. And I remember my group, it had been about eight months since they had a leader. And so I remember going and having this time with them and hearing, man, there was a lot of unconfessed sin. 
And I thought, man, wow, how hard must that have been to not have anybody to talk to for eight months, mm -hmm. for six months, just dealing with all that pain and hurt in their hearts. And when we were able to deal with all that sin, we were able to move forward. You guys have to find a way to consecrate the camp. Now, if you want to do this correctly, for this to work out, you've got to build family. That's point number two. Create family and identity. Go back to Nehemiah chapter three. And we're going to read in verse one. Is everybody still awake? Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's go, really. right. It says, Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priest, went to work to rebuild the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place. Building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated as far as the Tower of Hanau. The men of Jericho built adjoining sections, and Zakar, son of Amir, built next to them. And as it goes on in Nehemiah chapter 3, it talks about more and more people building the wall. We see here that every person had a job to do. That everybody had a role in building the wall. And what that does for them, it makes them feel like, man, this is a part of me. I'm doing something. Even if I'm building the dumb gate, which is the nasty gate, that's my job. I've got something to do. And so your students need to have something to feel like this is my ministry. Mm. There needs to be a sense of family and identity in your group that's centered around Jesus. Most of them come from broken homes. They don't understand how healthy relationships. They've got, you know, brokenness in their lives. And they need someone to teach them what it's like to have family, real family. And that's you. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, it says, They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to the fellowship to breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's the apostles figured it out. They understood that, man, if, if we can build family, send it around Jesus, people are going to get excited about that. And when they did it, people were like, man, I want, what, are you, what do you guys have? I want to have that in my life. And so they joined up because there was family that was built there. I remember when I first came to church, that's what inspired me. There were people that wanted to give me food. I was like, for one, I'm coming for that. You got food? I'm there. Of course, I was a broke college student, so feed me. That's awesome. But they cared about me. I remember going to churches, and I would walk in, and no one would say hi to me at all. And I would leave. I went to a school with a guy that said, hey, what church do you go to? I said, I go to this church. He's like, me too. How long have you been going there? He's like, five years. Me too. I've never seen you before. Because that was the kind of church you went to. You walk in with your head down, and you go to church, and you come out, and you go back and do what you were doing. But this church... I walked and people were hugging me. Yeah. And I was like, hold on, I know you're What's up, man? Yeah. Yeah. And it was awkward, but I felt like, okay, they care. They were asking me questions. What's your life about? What do you do? Where, like, where do you live? Well, I'm like, all right, that's kind of weird, but it's just different. They were serving me and loving me, and I thought, man, wow, I've never seen this before. Yep. That's what you're trying to build. Mm -hmm. Family. Where students go, man, I want to be here. I feel comfortable here. I can let my hair down here. This is, these are my people. When I am with them, I feel complete. Mm -hmm. A.W. Tozer, who's a pastor in the 50s, he wrote this. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard which each must individually bow. Mm -hmm. So 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be. Where they, they become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God and strive for a closer fellowship. If we're all pointed towards Jesus, it brings unity to us. So if you can build family in your group, centered around Jesus, man, the connection can be unbreakable. They need that. You guys got to find a way to build family. So things that we did in our group, we made t-shirts. Right. Yeah, I mean, you guys got to have your own, your own identity. What's your group name? Here's some t-shirts. Get that stuff going. We dedicated a cabinet in our pantry just for them. So when you come to our house, all your food is right here. Eat whatever you want. We brought all the campus stuff and put it in our garage. I remember them coming over like, we have somewhere to put our stuff now? I'm like, yeah, do it in my garage. There was like 17 houses of stuff that was all over the place. They didn't have their own spot. So we said, put it here. This is, this is your house. 
We told him, if you're going to come over, text me first. Then amen. Yeah, this is your house. <laughs> we bought a baptistry. And we were painting it the colors of the school. And they're going to paint it. We made a giant Jenga. And every student signed a block with their name on it. And we have 24 students right now, and there's 75 blocks. And our goal is to have all those blocks filled out by a student by the end of the year. And together we're going, hey guys, this is our stuff. This is your stuff. We're building family together. Yeah. Guys, yeah. a good sign is when they don't need your house. When you're like, I got to kick you out. That's when you're family together. And it happens about every night. Y'all just come ahead. It's 9 o'clock. Can I come over? I'm like, eh, yeah, for a little bit. And then about 12, I'm like, all right, y'all, it's time to go to bed. You need to go home. But that's a good sign. If they're coming over and spending time and eating your food and playing with your kids, whatever you got, if they're coming over, that's a really good sign. Yep. They feel connected to you. Let's go. You're building family. And the last thing you need to do is you need to be the change that you want to see. Yep. That's point number three. <laughs> go back to Nehemiah chapter 6. It says, one day, in verse 10, I went to the house of Shemin, of Delilah, and the son of Bethel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should I, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalah had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also your prophet Nodiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. And we're going to stop there. So this guy comes as a prophet, but he's really not, to deceive Nehemiah. And he says, well, we, they're going to kill you, so why don't you come with me in the temple? Let's close the doors and, and hide from these guys. And Nehemiah goes, man, I'm smarter than that. Because if I go into the temple, I'm going to be sinning against God. You're trying to discredit me. And so he stands firm and obeys God. Yeah. And because of what he does, man, his example is set that people can see and go, man, I can follow that guy. If he would have went into the temple and closed those doors, they would have discredited him. So nobody would have followed him anymore. All his work of building the wall would have been useless. But for you, what example are you setting? Your example to your campus ministry is of utmost importance. Mm. Because if you're not modeling the change that you want to see, they're not going to respect you or follow you anywhere. You've got to be, read your Bible. You've got to be deep in prayer. You've got to share your faith. You've got to bring visitors to events yourself. Because you're calling them to do that. Mm. What's it look like when you're like, man, aren't you bringing any visitors? When was the last time you brought a visitor? Well, you're right. <laughs> what can you say? Yeah, yeah. You can't call them to anything if you're not doing it yourself. Yeah, we can't settle for having lackluster times with God as campus ministers. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can't settle for not having real change when it comes to sin and being inspired by other guys in the world, but not by the Bible and God. We're preaching the word to these campus students. You've got to be inspired by God's word. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It starts with you. You've got to be men and women with audacious faith. We're, we're going to win the world for Christ. Our students need to see us making faithful and bold decisions and experiencing victories and defeats. But staying the course in bold situations. The guy that trained me told me this one day. He said, listen, you'll be hot dogs one day and dog food the next. And what that means is don't take too much credit for the good stuff or too much credit for the bad stuff. Because it's going to ebb and flow. So some days they're going to go, man, you're so awesome. And the next they're going to say, man, you're pretty terrible. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it just ebbs and flows. And so don't get too good. Like, man, we had three baptisms. I'm awesome. Then the next year you're going to have no baptisms and you suck. But it's okay. You've got to ride it out with God. Yeah. Be faithful. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 14, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into a fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Mm. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing 
will be impossible for you. Amen. We've got to set some lofty faith goals and put them before God and go after them. Guys, one thing that we did that was pretty crazy, I went to an advanced retreat in March in, in L.A. And they started talking about this idea of the G Club and going out and sharing with a thousand students in a week. And I heard this and I thought, man, you guys are nuts. I'm never going to go and share a thousand students in a week. That's kind of crazy. You guys can do that. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Then I came home to Phoenix and we had a leaders meeting. And I told them, I said, man, I heard this crazy idea. I should have never said anything. And, uh, <laughs> there was a brother there that said, after he heard me, he, was, he came and said, bro, let me talk to you. I think we should do it together. Wow. And I was like, uh, you know, and I was kind of like, uh, maybe like next week, bro. He's like, no, I was like, let's do it right now. And I started thinking, I'm like, okay, you're like in your 50s, bro. Uh, I'm like 30 years old. I, if you can do it, I got to do it, man. So I was kind of like, I was kind of proud of him. If you can do it, I'm going to do it too. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to take my little bit of faith and I'll go. Mm-hmm. And I challenged myself and said, listen, guys, I'm going to share with a thousand people in a week in five days. That's 200 a day. And I'm going to share, 200 a day, if you share more than me in one day, I'm going to buy you dinner wherever you want to go. Wow. If you share with a thousand in a week, I'm going to make you a t-shirt. The thousand share club. And so I said it before him. The first day we went out and I shared with, I think, 242. The second day was like 230. The third day, blah, blah. By the end of the, by the end of five days, I shared with 1,105 people. Yeah. By the end of the week, I was like, here, come to this thing. Come to this. I was so tired. I'm like, just, just show up, please. I don't even know. I'm not saying I'm like, I stopped saying good stuff. I was like, here's a card. Come to church. Just be there. I was exhausted. But what was so cool is that as I was sharing with people, I saw our cards on tables. In people's hands. Someone was like, oh, someone shared with me over there. And I was like, wow. We shared with over 4,000 students in five days. Just from having a lofty goal. And I was like, man, God is moving. Yeah. Now, crazy thing is that nobody came out from that. 4,000. Not one person. And I was in my pride, like, man, I'm about to, it's about to get 100 baptisms. It's about to be so sick. I'm like, oh, so tight. Blah, blah. And I was discouraged. I'm like, 4,000 people and nobody came out? So then next week, I was like, no, I'm going to share faith no more. Yeah. So I was on campus, and I'm like, man, I'm just, I got to go share. I'm the campus minister. I'm going. So I was just kind of moseying around. Hey, you want to come to Bible talk? I was like, yeah. I'm like, all right, it's over there. <laughs> Another guy, you want to come? Yeah, it's over there. And they both came. I was like, all right, cool. And wow. I was studying the Bible, and I was like, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> and then he became a Christian. Wow. And he's here this weekend. Woo! Now, that was the second week. After all that thousand. But God wanted me to say, it's not about you. Right. It's about what I do. Right. And I thought, man, that makes sense. I've got to have faith in you, God, that you're going to move the mountains in my life. And if I just stay the cruise and do what I'm supposed to do, you're going to bear fruit. Guys, we can change the world. But it's all about what are you setting in place for your ministry to be successful? It takes time. It takes a lot of time, honestly. And you've got to have a heart that's set on doing what God wants you to do. You've got to survey the wall. Great family and be the change you want to see. Amen. Alright. Daniel. Alrighty, guys. Let's give it up one more time for Willard, man. That was good. I'm not gonna lie, when he told me about the G Club, I was like, you guys go do that. <laughs> that. Convicting though, right? Yeah. So my name is Daniel Garcia. I am a uh, campus leader in Fort Collins, Colorado. Originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've, yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. So I have three things that I want to talk to you guys about today. Number one is the heart behind the mission. Number two, how that heart drives you to love the body. And number three, how that heart drives you to love the lost. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's go. A couple quick questions real quick. Why do you guys brush your teeth? I did. Really? Why do you brush your teeth? Tell me. Keep them clean. Keep them clean. It's a habit. It's a, it's a habit. Oh, so your breath don't stink. So your breath don't stink. So that significant other might like it when you smile. You know what I'm saying? Why do you, why do you go to school or go to work? Get money. That's important, right? Deeper question, why are you here? Why are you at ICMC? You see, here's the thing. We have specific motivations for everything that we do. And the question is, what is the right heart between, uh, what is the right heart behind the mission to follow Jesus? 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and again, the scriptures are here on this page. We'll jump right in at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, for their sake, was died and raised. The love of Christ has to be the motor that drives everything. The love of Christ and the blood of Christ have completely and utterly redefined you guys. The old you that could not possibly coexist with the perfect and holy God is gone. When, when God sees you, He no longer sees the old you. The one that you're embarrassed to tell your friends about who that old person was. Yeah. And truthfully, who that person really is still inside of you because we're all still sinners. Yeah. Yeah, so. Verse 21 says it this way. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became sin, the dirtiest possible thing, everything that God is not. He became that on the cross so that we may take on His righteousness, not our righteousness. Let me tell you where your righteousness does not come from, how spiritual you appear. It's so easy to walk around ICMC and want to look a certain way. Even all week long as I'm preparing for this, I'm thinking, I hope I look good when I preach this lesson. How spiritual you appear has nothing to do with how righteous you are. It's not how many people come to Bible talk. And it's not how many people your ministry baptizes in the fall. Those are all things we want to strive for, but that is not where your righteousness comes from. And God forbid we ever take credit for the things that God has done. Psalm 115 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the, for the sake of your love, steadfast love and faithfulness. We must remember where our right standing in front of God comes from. I'll read it again. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, guys, this is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And when you understand it on a heart level, like when it's really in there, it is the breeding ground for your sanctification. It is the root of which your transformation into the likeness of Christ can grow. But your heart has to be there. You have to see him on the cross and know that was for you. I have a question. Do you guys think that the Apostle Paul knew anything about starting a new ministry? Maybe planted a church or two? No. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he said, And when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. To know nothing? I mean, this is arguably the most corrected church in the New Testament. You can find plenty of practicals in the book of Corinthians about what to do and what not to do. Okay? But he said, I resolve to know nothing among you but this, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You listen to enough sermons, eventually someone is going to pull out the line, what do you want people to say about you at your eulogy when you die? What do you want people, what do you want to be known by? Do you want to be known as, as as the class clown? You want to be the no, be known as the guy that was reliable, not reliable, something, something. You know what I want them to say at my funeral? He resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm-hmm. That's what I want them to say. And then again, as another reminder, in case they had forgotten, in chapter 15, starting in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. There's a reason, guys, where he says, I delivered this to you as a first importance. He didn't say, I delivered to you as a first importance the long list of things that you guys were doing wrong. He said, remember, guys, if you forget this, it's going to cause problems. Of first importance, Jesus died for you, and you need it. From the beginning until the end, what it's all about is Jesus. Yeah. 
And when you love, when the love of Christ is the motor that drives, or when the love of Christ is not the motor, we have problems. Yeah. And it should be the foundation of every D group, every encouragement date, yeah. every Bible study. And it needs to be the foundation on which you build or start a new ministry. Amen? Amen. Number two, love in the body. We're in this together, guys. Yeah. Starting in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints, you guys, for the work of the ministry, for, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human, coming, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Think about this. Unity of the faith. Knowledge of the Son of God. Maturity. Maturity, not just, not just maturity, mature, maturity to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Have any of you guys achieved that yet? No. I'm working, and I hope I work until the day I drop. Yeah. There's a purpose behind this, behind being together. And there's something that the Apostle Paul knew about when he was writing this. And verse 14 talks about how, so that we won't be swept away by every, by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Whose responsibility is it to fight for those of, for your brothers and sisters? It's your responsibility in your ministry to fight for the faith of those around you. Yeah. If you've been around for any length of time, you know that those waves, they come often. And they come when you least expect them. Yeah. The deceitfulness of the world. Mm -hmm. Think about the weight of that. Like, we're here at ICMC, and it's like one of the most comforting places you could ever be because you know the deceitfulness of the world is not coming from my brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as we step back out, as soon as we get back to our hometowns, it's going to be abundantly clear that we're back in the world again. Yeah. Back on campus, pushing back darkness for Jesus. Mm there's a movie that came out years ago. It's called The Guardian. It's got Kevin Costner and Ashton Kutcher about rescue swimmers. Some of you guys may have seen it. Um, there was a scene in there, and, and Kevin Costner is Master Chief. He's known as the rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard that saved hundreds and hundreds of people. And he's kind of a legend, and he's now teaching this class. He's now raising up new Coast, uh, Coast Guard swimmers. And everyone wants to know, how many people, how many people has Master Chief saved? How many people is it? So Ashton Kutcher gets him alone and he says, what's your real number? How many people? And Kevin Costner kind of just stares at him blankly and he says, 22. And Ashton's like, well, it's good. It's not 200, but I mean, that's good. And he said, 22 is the number of people that I've lost. Yeah. It's the only number I kept track of. Yeah. You know, my number is, since I became a Christian, 16. I've seen 16 people, 16 of my brothers and sisters walk away yeah. since I started my walk with Christ. I, I know every single one of their names. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about them. Yeah. That's what bothers me. That's what Dave was talking about on stage at the main session today. He said, what hurts the most, not, not the amount of time that I spent crying over my sin or, or any of this other stuff. What bothers him the most is the people that leave. Yeah. Yes. That hurts. Mm -hmm. And it should hurt you. Yeah. It keeps me awake at night. We must fight for one another, guys. We must fight. It's not an option. No. But the question is, how? How do you fight for those around you? How do you fight for that faith? Let's keep it going to uh, Ephesians 4, back at the top. Starting in verse 1. It says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity of the Spirit 
in the bond of peace. Think about these traits, guys. All humility, not just a little humility, all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Who does this describe? Jesus. You see, when you build a ministry, it's going to be messy. It's not going to be pretty. And there are going to be times where the people around you fail. And the ones you notice the most are the times when you fail. But the way you love people in the midst of that failure is going to define the ministry that you have. I want to share a quick example with you guys. About a year, the very first year... Of, of walking with Jesus was by far the hardest. And take a side note here. That first year of the Christians that you raise up, remember that it's their first year. Okay? Because looking back now, I have all these young Christians in front of me in their first year and they're struggling. I'm like, okay, I was there, I was there, I was there. You have to remember that. You have to remember that. But anyway, the example is um, I came into the kingdom in a long term relationship. I mean, I had been with the same woman since I was 16. And uh, it was at the very end of a four and a half, five year relationship. And we were engaged at one point and that ended. And I thought the whole time that I was the strong one, but uh, that wasn't true. I, I, I went into like a depression. Uh, my whole world came crashing down around me. And so much so that I was decided, I decided I was going to leave the church. I was done. Yeah. Uh, and I was living my old life again, but not telling anybody anything. I was completely duplicitous. And one day I got home from work, probably about two months before the lease at this brother's house had ended. And so I was going to wait out this lease and then I was going to move out. And the, uh, my best friend, the guy who, who baptized me, and uh, my other best friend um, said, hey, we need to talk to you in the other room. And we had eight guys in the house at the time. And uh, he said, we need to talk to you. So I was like, okay, something's up. So I go into the room and the first thing... Um, you'll see him, if you're in the guy's lesson tomorrow, Armin Day is the guy, and uh, he brought me in, into the room and he said, I'm going to read you a scripture. It says, all will be laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Mm. I was like, oh, this ain't good. He knows. <laughs> and he began to tell me how God had revealed what I had been up to. And I, and I was like, you're right. You're 100% right. I'm, I'm caught red-handed. There's nothing I can do. Mm. But I told him I wasn't going to change. So he said, all right, well, let me know when you want to change. And then he left. That's not what he did. He pleaded with me for the next two hours, reminding me of the call to which I've been called. Reminding me of who I am in Christ now. This isn't who Daniel's defined by anymore. And finally, two hours in, I broke down crying. And I realized, what am I doing? I can't go back to this. And so from that day forward, my life has been a completely different story because he was willing to step into the mess for me. Are you willing to step into the mess for your brothers and sisters? Better is open rebuke than hidden love. You will have to look at someone in the eye at some point and say, I won't give up on you. Even when they want to give up. So you're going to have to move to some other city or something to get rid of me. <laughs> and even that might not work. You know, that, those, are, those are the things that you can do. The only thing that eases any bit of feeling in your heart when someone leaves the faith is knowing that I, I gave it all I had for that person. I, I went to their work, encouraged them. I drove to their house and forced them to go to church a few times even when they didn't want to. You know, those are the things that say, you know what? I gave all I had. I can't do anything else. It's God that's going to take care of them from now on. And remembering at the end of the day, just like Willie was saying, you know, you can't take too much of the credit and you can't take too much of the blame. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The unity described in this scripture doesn't just happen at random. It's forged in the fires of the trials that we face. See James 1 for that one. When we attack them together and strive to walk the way Jesus did, unity is produced. And finally, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, the Christ, into Christ. If you want your ministry to grow up in numbers, 
If you want your ministry to grow up in maturity, you have to grow up. Yeah. What does that mean? What does it mean that you have to grow up? I have to grow up. That means you no longer have time to play video games for hours. Yeah. Yeah. That season of your life is gone. I no longer have time to wake up in the morning and scroll on social media for hours and skip your quiet time. There's no more time for that. You got to grow up. I no longer have time to obsess over who's interested in who in the ministry. That takes too much time. There are souls at stake. You don't have time to sleep until 10 a.m. You don't have time to sleep until 9 a.m. If you're sleeping at 10 a.m., you need to have a talk with somebody. You can sleep when you're dead. That's for ICMC too. Hebrews 12 says, let us throw off all that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Without his grace being our motivation, we will grow bitter. If it's just us doing religious things, we will be bitter and there will be malice in our heart against the people that love us. But when the love of Christ is at the center of the motivation, we will love the body with all humility, gentleness, patience. We will bear with one another in love, and we will build up the body of Christ. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is loving the lost. Verse 16 says... From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him as thus no longer. And basically what this is saying is is we've got to have a perspective change. We now see everyone through an eternal lens. Let me explain to you guys what that means real quick. Another movie reference, I'll make it quick. It's Lion, the movie Lion. It's about the kid who um, loses his family when he's little in India. It wasn't very popular, so I don't think you guys have seen it. But... Basically what happens is two little poor kids in India are growing up and they work. One's like four, one's like eight, and they work and provide food for their family. And the older brother is going to go work the night shift, and the younger brother begs him, can I come, can I come, can I come? The older brother says, no, you're too little, you can't do this work, you can't carry bales of hay. And he says, can I come, can I come, can I come, can I come, can I come? And finally he says, okay, you can come. They take the long ride, the long train ride to the work site, and by the time that happens, the little boy, his name was Saru, he was asleep. And his brother says, I knew this was going to happen. You stay here. You sleep on this bench. When work is over, I'll come back and get you. Little Saru wakes up in the middle of the night, and he realizes there's nobody here. No one at the train station. There's a train there, but nobody's on the train. It's just parked. And so he looks around for a while, can't find his brother. So he gets on the train, and then he falls asleep. And when he falls asleep, the train leaves and goes 1,500 miles to Bengali, where they speak a completely different language. He's lost. He gets off the train. Crowds of people everywhere. You're watching this movie thinking, somebody help this kid, but nobody understands the language he's speaking. Let me tell you about this perspective change. Before you know Jesus, before you've been given the ministry of reconciliation, you have the lens of Saru, the little boy. You get out, you're lost, you're looking for purpose, you're looking for help, you're looking for something, for someone that can help you. The world is huge, and there's just people in the way, and that's all that really matters. When you have the perspective change, when it becomes eternal, you become the person watching the movie, only it's not Saru you're concerned about. You see the crowds, and they're wandering around, and they're all Saru. They're all the kid. They're all lost. And it's your job, your responsibility to have a new lens. You have to see things differently. We don't regard anyone as of the flesh any longer. We'll continue reading here. Oh, not yet. It's like Matthew 9, where he says, he looks, he, uh, Matthew 9, 36, when he says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so your heart is broken for the lost. You will never find joy in the ministry of reconciliation. But when the grace of God saturates your very being, the ministry of reconciliation is the most exhilarating, fulfilling purpose you'll ever take part in. Have you guys ever studied the Bible with people and like seen them understand God? Like seen them understand the cross for the very first time. 
I could die and go to heaven when that happens. That's like, that is everything. And if you're not finding joy in that, if the grace hasn't, of God hasn't saturated heart and you're not taking joy in that, then you should start there. That's a great place to start. Every person that we lock eyes with matters. You guys ever be sharing your faith on campus and like you see somebody and they make eye contact with you and then they get past you and you're like, why didn't I open my mouth? But then they're walking away and you're like, oh, it's too late. Dang it. They're way too far away. Like, I, I, I recently developed a conviction where like when that happens, I got to go back. Yeah. Even, if, even if they're across like way far away, I have to like run and go get them. Yeah. Like that's, just do it. You'll sleep better. I promise. <laughs> Let's go, man. I'm waiting for the time where one of those guys gets baptized. I know it's going to happen. Yeah. If you had the cure for cancer, would you share it? Yeah. No. You have the cure to death. Go share it. Yeah. If you're not there right now, if, if, if the grace of God is not motivating your heart to do good things, to build up your ministry, to share your faith, you need to start there. Verse 18 through 20. In 2 Corinthians 5 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see, Paul knew in Acts chapter 20 where he's speaking to the elders in Ephesus. But by this point, you know, Paul has experienced a lot. If you just read that whole Acts chapter 20, you can tell, dude is beaten up. He's been through it. He's been shipwrecked. He's been left for dead on more than one occasion. He's just been through it. And in verse 24, he says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor precious to myself, if only I may finish the course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He says, I count my life of no value. Zero value. It's not precious to me at all. He is like, let that sink in. No value at all. I mean, I almost changed my shirt because I got some ketchup on my shirt. I was worried about you guys seeing my ketchup shirt. Like, I'm thinking, do you think Paul cares about ketchup on his shirt? I count it as nothing. Oh, my, only, my only job is to finish my course. The Ministry of Reconciliation. That's my job. That's what I do. I wake up every day, and the only thing I know is violent persecution is coming my way. There's a good chance I'm getting beat down. But it doesn't matter. That's not what my job's about. My job is having this new eternal lens. Preaching the gospel to everyone. Right after that, in in Acts 20, he says, I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. Can you say that? In your your campus ministry, I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. Because I've I've told you the truth. We've got to ache for that. We've got to be innocent of the blood of all men just so that we know that they've heard the good news. They've had their chance. You have to examine yourself right now, right where we stand. If I followed you around when you get back from this trip, would your life reflect one that's been radically transformed by the grace of God so much so that you count your life as nothing just so that you might save some? Is that, is that what I would see? You've got to examine yourself. If we are going to do this, our heart has to break for the lost it has to break and if it doesn't you start there dear God break my heart for what breaks yours help me have a passion and a deep love for those who are lost and this even ties in with the first point Willie was talking about deal with the sin if you don't have a heart for the lost right now there's a very good chance there's some sin clouding your heart if you can't get in touch with the grace of God there's a very good chance that there's a part that you're not taking before God He knows what you're doing, guys. Get real with Him. And let the grace of God pour over you. It's there. It'll never leave you. But experience it, and then you can go help other people. We've got to understand this, guys. David Platt, some of you guys may have heard him. He says, church, we are plan A and there is no plan B. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another great quote is Charles Spurgeon said, as far as Christians, we are either missionaries or we are imposters. In conclusion, God forsook his only son because of our direct rebellion. And you know when he did that? At our worst. 
While we rejected him, he went to the cross. It wasn't when we were nice and cleaned up. It wasn't when we joined the G Club, even though that's awesome. (laughs) That's not when he died for you. He died for you when you turned your back, when you spit in his face. When you challenged everything he's ever given you and took credit for what is his. That's when he died. Our communion with the God of the universe is why we wake up in the morning. He's the creator, fulfiller, and sustainer of all things, every part of life. The good news of the gospel deepens the roots of our existing ministry, and it feeds the fire for our pursuit to win Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming and, and checking it out. Right now we're going to have a time... <clears throat> to go through this list of resources and practicals. And then if we have a few minutes left, we'll take questions. And so there's some things that, just good things to think about when you're coming into a campus ministry. So if you go to that page in the middle, we're going to go through these questions really quick. The first one is, what will success look like for you after your first semester and after your first year? Because most times when you come into a new group, if there are things that have gone on, you're not going to have 50 baptisms the first year. And so you can't go, man, if we don't have 50 baptisms, we haven't done a great job. You've got to find things that are going to go, this is going to be my measure of success for this first semester and this first year. For us, it was, we're going to raise up leaders. We need to find six key leaders that we can work through for the rest of this year, and that will be success for us. Not just the baptisms, they will come, and they have, but we're not focused on that right now. Because we're at a place where we need to fix people first, and then move forward. The second thing, what culture do you want your campus ministry to have, and are you modeling that culture? What will the standards of your group be to create or uphold the culture that you're trying to create? If you want people to be humble, you've got to be humble. If you want them to be honest, you've got to be honest. You're building a culture for your campus ministry, and it starts with you. What's your vision for your campus? Who will your core leaders be? And what is your plan to train those core leaders? And where is your home base on campus going to be? Your kids need to see that there's a place they can go all the time where you'll be at. Ours is the MU. I'm usually in the MU from this time to this time. If you need me, come see me. So I go certain days of the week, and I'm there for whatever they have, questions they want to know. If they just want to hang out with me, have a Bible study, whatever, I'm always in the same spot. I'm going to go share, and I'm coming back. So they can come and talk to me whenever they need. So they can feel like, man, this is my place of sanctuary in between class or whatever else. I have somewhere to go. Some building family ideas. These are things that we did. Anything with food, barbecues. At the very beginning, they're all coming over for barbecues. Set those things up. Bunko night. Bunko is a dice game. It's Google it. Okay, it's really fun. It might sound lame, but it's tight. The kids love it. And and we did stuff like that, and it brings a lot of visitors out. Game nights, special events. You know, we take the guys fishing, or the girls have a baking. I actually took the guys. This is dangerous. I took them shooting. And you got to protect yourself. I was like, you know, I was kind of scared. But it worked out. But we went on some kind of just making memories with each other. Special times with them. They go, man, my camp semester loves me. He wants to take me somewhere. So do special things with your people. We have the Marys adopt a campus student. So they feel like they have a home away from home. They can go for a home cooked meal and have a family time. And so we encourage our our region to say, hey, grab a student and create family with them. It bridges the gap. Because in most churches you go, you got your campus kids, you got your married, you got your singles, and they don't coexist. But if we create family between the lines, it opens the door for the transition later on. So it's important to have, you know, somebody adopt a campus student. And we pray often together. You've got to train them to think biblically. And so what you do with your times with them are very important. So you always need to be praying at the end of your D times, your hangout times, whatever it is, so they can see your heart for God, and you can train them to have the same kind of heart. Yep. Creating ownership ideas. Get a baptistry. Get something that's theirs or find a spot. This is where we're going to do our baptisms at and, and do something to remember that, right? Write people's baptism names or their dates or whatever it is. Have those things. Like we had a sister get baptized last night in the river, but when we go home, she's going to sign the baptistry. You know what I mean? Because that she, she became one of the number. And so that's cool to be able to have that and see, man, who came through and became a Christian in our time there. Yeah. Right? Think about the Jenga. Each, each person gets a block. We're working together to, to fill all the blocks up. We, we made stickers for our group, Alpha Omega Phoenix. We made some mm-hmm. pretty cool stickers to have, put on your car, put on your notebook, all that kind of stuff. And we made banners for our rush week. Mm-hmm. So when people see us, they'll know, man, this is Alpha Omega. And we can say, man, this is our group. And I had some of the students design it themselves. So they feel like, I, I did that. And I'm passing these stickers out. Faith-building ideas. Now, the Thousand Share Club. 
I encourage you to do it. That mess was crazy. But it was really encouraging and God moved in a powerful way. And what I did is I went out and bought a thousand packs of the little five gum. And I put our Bible talk information on each single one. I took like little address labels and put it on every one. And I started sharing gum. And people want gum. If you got a car, you're like, I don't want no car. I'm like, I got some gum. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll take that. And I'm like, yeah, here's the gum. Here's my Bible talk information. Come to that. And so it was easier if I was sharing with them with gum, water, whatever it is. But find some kind of thing to get them engaged. Because not everybody wants a car. But if they, you know, if you got gum or some water or whatever, they'll, they'll take that. And so that's what I did. But do something and really raise the level of faith for your students. Have evangelism goals. I try to share with at least 200 people a week or two, whatever it is. Like if I can share with 100 to 200 a week, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. And so for yourself, you've got to find out, man, what things can I do in a week that is faithful? If I can share with 200, whatever that is every day, so that I know that I'm continuing to share my faith. I've got to have goals. Mm -hmm. You can't just go up to the campus and be like, all right, man, I'll just see what happens. But I've got to have a vision that I need to share with 20 today, 20 tomorrow, whatever it is, so I can really meet the world for Christ. My school has about 60,000 students on campus in, in Phoenix, 90,000 total, it's the biggest school in the nation. And so for me to be able to meet that many people, i got to share a lot. And so it's important for you to be able to gauge that, man. What do we need to be? What kind of goals do I need to set to be able to reach them all? And some really good books to help you are these. There's the Master Plan of Evangelism. This is a really good one right now. We're going through this in, with our group for the summer. And so this is a really good breakdown of really of discipleship, but also how Jesus built his ministry. It's really short. It's like 100 pages. It's in a really incredible book. This one here, Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders, is another, another really great book that you can read that will help you with that. And actually, I just got this one today from the book table. I heard it was really good. never read it before. But I heard it was awesome, and it's W. Chicago, so why not? But this one talks about changing the culture of your campus ministry. This is really helpful. And one we're reading as a church, which has been really life-changing for us, is Radical Love. It talks about loving people in a radical way in different sections of your life. And this can be really great for you to really change the course of your campus ministry. And so these are the resources that we've used in the past that have helped us to be able to get where we're at now. And hopefully they can help you. And if we've got a couple minutes, like two, we can have some time for Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so um, I think it was during your lesson you were talking about um, just like fighting for people and not letting people not losing brothers and sisters and I just thinking about the people that I've lost over the years too but I guess like my question is what's the line between fighting for someone and realizing that you care more about their salvation than they do that may be stopping you from getting to other people that actually want it so like what helps you figure out okay this person really like I mean it, it talks about disciples like you know does their feet off and so what I mean what helps you figure out that now I think it's I think one of the most important things is to ask them good questions. If you got to find out, do you actually want me here fighting for you? Like, like there's a line, you, you fight as much as you can, but I mean, if you if you push them to be holy, they'll either, usually they'll either actually repent or they'll, t they'll leave. You know, and so that's not always the case. There are situations, but for the people who are harder and harder and who just don't seem to respond, you have to get firmer and eventually... You're going to push them so hard that they just don't want to be around you or they're finally going to get it. And and that is also tempered with the people who are around you. Like, hey, I feel like I've been given everything. You go to your you know, leader of the church or some people that you trust, some elders, and say, hey, how do I know the line here? Because each situation is going to be a lot different. And so, you know, it's taking advantage of your resources and, and just giving all that you have. And when you get people involved, you usually come to good you know, I think just keep wading in, you know. People, people's true colors will come out. They even ask them, "Do you want to get well?" And that's a good question. Like, do you yeah. really want this? You know, and if they don't, you can't force them to drink the water. You know what I'm saying? So you got to wade in really hard. I think don't give the pressure up, right? Keep your finger pressed on them and see, like, are you really going to crack under pressure? Or are you going to stand firm? Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? So don't don't shrink back. Go after people. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? um, it's probably on the same lines of uh, getting after campus students that uh, that have a religious background mm -hmm. and so when you when you sit down and you study the Bible with them they kind of have the they know what answers to say right yeah and so now they're um, so now they're checking it off their list versus actually having a conviction mm -hmm. so how do you gauge like so do you keep going on with Bible studies or do you or do you stop so you <coughs> Correct their character, or I, I mean, 
how do you know if they're just saying yes because it, that's the correct answer so they yeah. can, you know, check out the list or yeah. if they're actually being convicted? Uh, what I like to do uh, to gauge that is give them homework. Like I ask them, like I give them goals to hit. You need to do this. You need to, you know, share your faith or whatever else. In the Bible says, confess your sin, because they're gonna, they'll do stuff like they'll give you their answers, but if their hearts really change, they'll do what the Bible calls them to do. And so you've got to give them some goals. Like, okay, we have the word study. You need to read your Bible five days out of the week or whatever. If you're learning, you got to pray all that stuff. But give them goals to do, and if they're not doing it, you go, okay, they're not really going after this relationship. Really God is yours. It's people who are hungry for God. They're calling you. Hey, can we get together? They're, they're going after it. Yeah. They're really baptized last night. She was like, I want to get baptized right now. Yeah. I guess it's midnight. Yeah. Like, you can you wait until tomorrow? She's like, I don't wait until tomorrow. Let's do it right now. I'm like, All right, well, go to, the, go to the river. It's dirty over there, but that's what you want to do. But her heart is like, I want to be saved. And there are some that are kind of like, yeah, I'll get together. I got time like next week. Mm-hmm. You don't really want to get together. Like, I'm asking you, and you're like, oh, you know, my schedule's kind of busy, so. Maybe like next Friday, you can just tell. You're like, okay. And we, you know, there's a guy right now that's been coming around. That he was, you know, really excited at the very beginning. And I'm like, all right, we're sitting by. He's like, oh, you're kind of busy. All right, man, well, you tell me. He hasn't come around yet. He comes to the events. I'm like, how you doing? He's like, I'm good. And he's never said he's sitting by. Like, right, you can be a friend. I'm like, we'll keep you. But I'm not going to pour my heart into you because you don't, we don't want more. And so you, you just got to give them some goals to hit and see what they do. Let's take a couple more because we're one more. <laughs> it's, it's done. Okay. Anybody else? Amen. Well, thank you guys for coming. Yeah.